Welcome to another edition of Dear John. I'm John Stockman with the law firm of Jensen and Stockman, located in Bloomington, Minnesota. Dear John is a program providing opinions and answers to your comments and questions about estate planning and more. And it's for all ages, singles, those in opposite and same-sex marriages, with or without children, widows and widowers. The show is called Dear John because, well, I'm John, and I'll be answering some of your emails during the show. Plus, I hope to clear up some of the legalese, you know, that complicated lawyer speak surrounding estate planning and probate. Oh, and we'll also be on location in Bloomington with our correspondent J.L. Peterson later in the program. But first, if someone you know has ever been admitted to a hospital or urgent care center, they may have been asked if there is a health care directive or a health care power of attorney. The admission staff will ask. Sometimes an ambulance EMT or paramedic will ask. If the patient, who could be you, has suffered an injury causing unconsciousness, who will make the medical decisions? If you don't have a health care directive, you should consider getting one done soon. Here's why. You've been in an accident resulting in life-threatening injuries. You are unconscious and being taken by ambulance to the ER of a nearby hospital where you receive urgent medical care. If your wallet, purse, or cell phone contains contact information, someone, perhaps a family member, is notified of your hospital admission. Then they are asked, is there a health care power of attorney? As gut-wrenching as that is to hear, it may be needed sooner or later, and having that document readily available will ease potential decisions regarding your welfare during this crisis. A health care directive, power of attorney, is a written document that informs others of your health care wishes, such as naming the person you designate as your agent, or what your preferences are regarding medical treatment, to resuscitate or not through life support, and even organ donations. It may be crucial if your attending physician determines that you can't communicate your health care choices because of physical or mental incapacity. Perhaps you're in a coma and needing sustained life support. Because you have a health care directive created some time ago, choices during a crisis are already determined with instructions on what you want or don't want done. A health care directive will serve to guide your physician, family, and friends. And yes, sometimes decisions surrounding life and death. It gives permission to make sensible decisions. The person designated as your health care power of attorney can make choices without regrets, knowing that you had made such decisions for him or her. It's important to know that regardless of having a health care directive, you can continue to make your own health care decisions as long as you're competent to do so. You can even change or cancel your directive any time, again, as long as you're physically and mentally capable. What should be included in your directive? What are the limits? The following information comes from the Minnesota Department of Health. What can I put in a health care directive? You have many choices. For example, you may include the person you trust as your agent to make health care decisions for you. You can also name alternative agents or joint agents. Your goals, values, and preferences about health care. The types of medical treatment you would want or not want, including instructions about artificial nutrition and hydration. How you want your agents to make decisions. Where you want to receive care. Mental health treatments that use electroshock therapy or neuroleptic medications. Donations of organs, tissues, and eyes funeral arrangements? Who would you like as your guardian or conservator if there is a court action? What are the limits on my health care directive? Your agent must be at least 18 years of age. Your agent cannot be your health care provider unless the health care provider is a family member or you give reasons why your agent is your health care provider. You cannot request health care treatment that is beyond reasonable medical practice and you cannot request assisted suicide. 
For more information and details, consult with a lawyer in your jurisdiction or reference the Minnesota Department of Health on facebook.com slash mnhealth. Also, here's a tip from emergency medical technicians. Keep a copy of your health care directive in your luggage when you're traveling and at home in an envelope clearly marked with your name and the phrase health care directive. Attach it to your kitchen refrigerator. EMTs will often look there first, and your family will most certainly look there if you let them know. Welcome back. Much of our email for today's program involves trusts. For many reasons, a trust is quite different than a will, yet often has similar outcomes. Let's try to understand the basics of a trust before we get to your emails. When making your estate plans, the focus is on distribution of your assets after you die and how to protect them from unnecessary estate taxes and probate court review. Establishing a trust helps achieve these goals. So what is a trust? Like a will, it's a legal document listing how your assets should be distributed after your death. A trust is also an arrangement where someone or a group of people are made responsible for those assets going to the beneficiaries without supervision by the probate court. In a trust, the persons assigned to do that are known as trustees. However, a trust is not the same as a will, and that's important to know because upon your death, without a trust, your assets must go through the probate court to be evaluated. The will must be validated prior to distributions, or the court will determine that there is no will with the result that your assets are distributed according to Minnesota statutes. Among other things, without a trust, your estate will become a public record for anyone to access and read. On the other hand, a trust transfers your assets privately, completely avoiding probate. Some think that trusts and wills are only for the wealthy. Not so. Anyone can have a trust to ensure that property of any sentimental or dollar value is dispersed according to your wishes. And you can help avoid using your home to pay debts upon your death, help avoid inheritance taxes, give property or funds to businesses or charities, and give property or money to a minor child at a specified age. And of course, there's much more to trust than what I covered here in the past few minutes. I invite you to contact me or an attorney in your area for further help. And now to your emails. Our first email is from Martin, who asks, My wife passed away recently and I own my home. I'd like my adult children to have it now before anything happens to me. Can I just put their names on the title to my home and other properties? There are many reasons not to put your children's names on the title of your home and properties, Martin. Doing so makes them co-owners. Then everyone, including you, must all agree to all things like selling, refinancing, or home improvement purchases. Or one of your children might have a dispute with you and lobby to make you pay rent. Or they may have a legal problem and lose their share of your home, or have a lien put against it. As unbelievable as that sounds, it has happened. Martin, I recommend you consider a revocable trust. Revocable meaning that you, as the trust grantor, have the flexibility to change the trust terms or even end the trust at any time while you're living. Then make the trust the owner of your home with your children as beneficiaries after your death. Nothing happens to your home until your death, and then your trustee is obligated to administer and distribute all of the assets according to the terms and rules you created.
This next email will serve to remind us why we should list some of our personal items in our wills or in a trust. Patty writes, Grandma passed away recently. She had a will which covered things like her house, car, and bank account, but said nothing about her furnishings, clothing, and her special jewelry. She owned a very nice diamond ring. As the executor of Grandma's will, I would like to hold the ring in a trust for her granddaughter until she's 18 years old. Can I do that legally, or do the girl's parents have a say about when and how she receives the ring? Patty, this depends on the language in the will. It sounds like Grandma's will is silent on how her personal items are to be distributed, or it leaves those decisions to the executor. In that case, then, it is possible for the executor to set up some arrangement, like a trust, for the granddaughter to receive the diamond ring. However, if there is language in the will controlling the distribution, then you, Patty, as the executor, must do as Grandma asked. I highly recommend that a will contain specifics about property and refer to a separate list of personal property, as in this example. I give the items which I own at the time of my death of tangible personal property described and to the persons named in a list which I propose to prepare either in my own handwriting or signed by me, which may from time to time be altered. Of course, there's more, Patty, but you get the idea. The point being, it's best not to have your property given away carelessly or decided by a judge in probate. It's best to draw up a will or trust, then list your personal property and name who gets what. And now we have Marsha asking, When I die, I want to leave a large amount of money to charity and to some special friends. I don't want this to become public knowledge, and I don't want my relatives to find out. I have personal reasons for this, and I'm told that I can have this done by setting up a trust. Is that true? Will it keep those donations private? In a word, yes. Establish a trust and appoint a trustee. Remembering, the trustee has responsibility to carry out your wishes, so please use common sense when choosing the trustee. Marcia, your trustee will privately supervise the management of your funds and hold the legal title to them until the time comes to give them to the beneficiaries you choose, including those charities and special friends you mentioned. But understand that a jealous relative could force your trustee into court to disclose the terms of the trust and prove that the distributions were proper. Again, a trust is not the same as a will. Your request of confidentiality works well with a trust, not so with a will, because when your will is filed with the probate court, the will and its contents become public knowledge. Marcia, the terms of your trust should never become public. No one but the person who drafted the trust, your trustee, and the beneficiaries of it will be aware of its contents. However, if privacy is your absolute goal, there are other tools available that your attorney can discuss with you to provide greater confidentiality. I'm JL Peterson, out and about in Bloomington. Today we have questions from newlyweds and newly divorced. Sound awkward? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome back to Dear John, a program providing opinions and answers to your questions and comments about estate planning, wills, trusts, and more. There's one more email I'd like to talk about before we move on. This one comes from Stephen, who's concerned about putting his elderly parents' home into a trust. Stephen writes, My parents are both enjoying life at 80-plus years of age. They already have a will, but I'm wondering if it's better to put their home into a real estate trust. There are a couple of things you and your parents should consider before making that kind of decision. First, if your parents become ill or just need help managing their finances, then a living trust can be an efficient way to manage their assets. Second, the main reason folks put assets like your parents' home into a living trust is to avoid having the assets sold and divided in probate court. Stephen, there is nothing inherently evil about probate, but it can be slow and expensive depending upon where your parents live. If everyone involved in your family pretty much agrees on what should happen with the house and the other assets, a trust is the most efficient way to go and has the added benefit of supervising the home and bank accounts when age makes it hard for your parents to take care of their assets.
I look forward to reading your questions and comments to Dear John and invite you to email the show at dearjohn at jensenstockman.com. That's dearjohn at jensenstockman.com. Your email will be reviewed for possible use in upcoming shows, and we appreciate your comments. Also, you can review streaming video for Dear John episodes on our website, jensenstockman.com. Well, there's J.L. Peterson, our roving correspondent. She's out and about in Bloomington getting questions from our viewers. Where are you today, J.L.? Hi, John. Today I'm at the Bloomington Civic Plaza where several people have some interesting questions for you. Out of concern to a lot of us that don't have a huge income or think wills are for older people, newlywed couple Jason and Brianna ask, if one or both of us die without a will or trust, what happens? They also want to know if making a will is expensive. Well, Jason and Brianna, congratulations on your marriage. I wish you a long and happy life together. As to your questions, if one dies without leaving a will or a trust, you are said to have died intestate. When a person dies intestate, state law governs how that person's property is to be distributed. In most states, your spouse and children would receive your property if you died intestate. If you have no spouse or children, your parents or siblings may inherit your property. After conducting an exhaustive search, the state takes your property if there is no one in your family tree who qualifies to inherit. So, having a will offers peace of mind by specifying who gets what, and that includes naming beneficiaries outside your immediate family, a charity, or a church. Jason and Brianna, your concern about the cost of wills is common. Preparing a will is not necessarily expensive. The price depends upon the amount of work that your lawyer does in resolving your issues. As a will becomes more complicated, the cost rises. Ask your lawyer for an estimate of the cost. In general, the trouble and expense of not having a will far outweighs the cost of the will. JL, do you have other questions? Well, this is an awkward segue, John, but the next question deals with divorce. It comes from a woman wishing to remain anonymous. She asks, my husband and I have our home in a trust, and we're currently in the process of getting a divorce. Can we transfer the home in our trust to me alone? A few issues need to be de examined to determine if a home contained within a living trust can be transferred from the trust to one of the trust creators as a part of a divorce settlement. These conditions are the trust is revocable, or the trust provides the ability of the trustees to transfer property, and all the creators and trustees, in the example, the husband and wife, are in full agreement. Then a deed can be prepared and filed transferring property from the trust to one of the spouses or a third party without complications. Thank you for watching today. We covered many difficult and important issues. I hope you'll appreciate that it's important for you to prepare a will or a trust in order to save your family from potential disagreements. It will be a great relief for your loved ones if for you to make these decisions now rather than have them publicly disputed in probate. Remember, no will, no trust, it goes public. We'll see you next time on Dear John.